Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Oldfield here with you. We're so glad you're with us and hope that you're ready for another study from God's Word. This is a live call-in program, and I'm going to give you the phone numbers. Go ahead and give you the phone numbers where you can call in and, and be a part of the program if you would like to do so. It's uh, area code 336-427-9696. That's 427-WMYN or 627-9563. That's 627-WLOE. This is how you can be part of the program, a word from the Lord. And uh, we are set to study from God's word. We're going to be talking about unity today and how to build upon unity, how to, how to create unity. Everybody uh, professes to be unified. We're all Christians, so to speak. But how is it that we're really uh, obtaining unity? How are we, how are we achieving this if, if we're not following the Bible? I... When I look at it um, in the community, I see everybody saying we follow the Bible, but everybody's different. So how is it that we have unity? Well, the Bible is going to give us a foundation. It's going to give us some information on how we can obtain unity. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, uh, 24-27, he gave a parable of a wise man who built his house. And in Matthew 27, he, he said uh, uh, the, the wise man... We know that I think we'll probably sing a song about it, uh, or that I did when I was growing up. But in Matthew 7, verse 24, Jesus says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I liken unto him a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Well, friends, I'm, I'm here to, to uh, suggest to you that if we're going to have unity, we have to build up on a a solid foundation that comes from God's Word. And that's actually how we're going to have any kind of, of faith, any kind of unity. It's going to be built upon God's Word. And so uh, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans ten seventeen. So today what we're going to be talking about is uh, seven, I'll, we'll call them seven spiritual stones that are fundamental to unity. If we're going to have unity, Jesus Jesus prayed for unity in uh, John uh, 17 and verse 21. Jesus said, uh, you know, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And so uh, this afternoon what we're going to be discussing is some uh, fundamental uh, building stones, fundamental foundational stones that we have to build on, we have to lay the groundwork for if we're going to indeed uh, achieve that unity. Uh, the, the, uh, the psalmist said, except, a, uh, uh, except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain to build it. And I'm saying anybody that says we're going to have unity and yet fails to go to God's Word and find the reason or find their faith of how to achieve that unity, they're actually just, you know, building in vain. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today, seven spiritual stones of unity. So if you want to be a part of that program, you want to uh, call in and, and have some input and some dialogue, we'll reason together, that's how you can uh, participate, 336 427 Nine six nine six. That's four two seven W M Y N or six two seven nine five six three six two seven W L O E. And that's of course that's area code three three six. Uh, friends, let me give you some more information while we're just uh, getting started here. A word from the Lord is brought to you by the Church of Christ. We meet at two fifty the Boulevard in Eden, uh, North Carolina, and we have uh, Bible study at nine a.m. on Sunday mornings, ten a.m. for worship. And Bible studies at 7 p.m. on Thursday nights, our, our midweek Bible study. And we'll be glad for you to come visit with us. Uh, bring your question, bring your, bring your pastor, bring your preacher, bishop, rabbi, whoever it may be. Someone that you trust to uh, uh, give you spiritual guidance or someone not maybe know the Bible maybe a little better than, than uh, you do. But we encourage dialogue. We want you to come out and study with us. And uh, oftentimes you don't find that. Oftentimes when you or asking someone to study the Bible, especially preachers, it seems like they don't, they're the ones that don't want to study. They're the ones that don't want to give an answer, but we're not that way. The Church of Christ that meets at 250 the Boulevard will be glad to study with you and, 
and uh, have some dialogue and because we're trying to find that unity that we're going to be talking about today. So if you want to visit with us, 250 the Boulevard on Sundays at 9 a.m., 10 a.m., or Thursdays at 7 p.m. is how you can uh, be a part of our assemblies. If you'd like to contact me, uh, again, my name is James Oldfield, and my email address is a word from the Lord at gmail.com. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. And my phone number is 276 340 2653. You can uh, find these lessons on YouTube as well. So if you're missing something, you want to go back and listen to it again, get online, go to YouTube, search for Word from the Lord, James Oldfield, and you can uh, find all these uh, programs, lessons there, plus many, many more. So. We hope that you'll take advantage of that. <clears throat> Anything we can do for your friends is free. We never beg for money from the community. You, you'll never hear of the Church of Christ uh, having begathons or telethons or moochathons or whatever it is that, that, that people do to try to raise money to fund their evangelism. This is brought to you by members of the Church of Christ that lay by and store up on the first day of the week. As the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, and that's how we put these programs on. So we hope that you will... Uh, come out and examine the Church of Christ. We're different than all the denominations because we're going to buy the Bible. And that, that may be that may sound strange to you, but that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to get back to the Bible, get people to go back to the Bible, study their Bibles, and we can have the unity that we're looking for, and that's what we're going to be talking about. So let's get back to it. Seven uh, uh, foundational stones, seven spiritual stones that will lay the groundwork for unity. How is it that we're going to have unity? Well, I want to start, let's start with uh, Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, and this is what <clears throat> what Paul says, Paul is writing to the, uh, the Ephesians, and we'll begin in verse 2, Ephesians 4 verse 2, he says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now there are seven ones there that, that Paul lists, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one, one God and Father of all. These seven things are, are, are fundamental to having unity. Now, someone might say, well, James, you know, I believe in all those things, and so we, we can have unity. Well, I submit to you, friends, that you might say, well, you believe one body, one spirit, and so forth, but the fact of the matter is when we start looking at what people believe, oftentimes it's not really what everybody else believes, and it's certainly not what the Bible teaches on these things. For example, if you ask, say, the Jehovah's Witness, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Well, they'll say yes. I mean, there Paul said in verse 5, Ephesians 4, 5, one Lord, and they'll say, well, Jesus, yeah, Jesus is Lord. But now what do they believe about Jesus? That's really what we're getting down to. So it's not just enough to say, I believe that. It's what do you believe about it? How, you know, how do you believe it? Uh, what, what does it mean when you say you believe it? So that's really why it's so important. But we're going to take these things, um, these, these seven things, one at a time. And I can assure you that as we're going through them, most people are not going to uh, be in agreement with each other on what these seven things are or what they mean or what the Bible says about them, but we have to be in agreement on what the Bible says about them if we're going to have unity at all. So let's just start with that one body. Paul said there's one body. Now, if I said that to the average person on the street who claims to be a Christian, and I said, now, do you believe that uh, Christians, all Christians should be part of the one body. And, oh, yes, yes, everybody's in part of the one body. We're all part of the body of Christ. If you're a Christian, you believe in Christ, you're part of the one body. But friends, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Scriptures teach, and that's and this is what I want to show you. See, I had to, we have to find out what, do, what is the body. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, there's one body, but what is that body? What if we back up to Ephesians chapter 1? Now, again, let's keep the context this. When Paul says one body in Ephesians 4... It, it would, you know, it really would uh, be a great service if people would just back up and get a little context. In the same letter, right before Paul said there is one body, he tells us what the one body is in Ephesians 1, in verse 22 and 23. He says that, that uh, God has 
put all things under Christ's feet. He gave him to be, he put all things under his feet. That's under Christ's feet. And gave him, that's Christ, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. So when you say, oh, I believe everybody's part of one body. What, do you believe everybody's part of the one church? Because I can assure you, when you start saying church, that is a whole different thing to most people. They're not listening, they're not hearing one body equals one church, but that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible is teaching about the body, that it is equal to the church. And so when Paul said there is one body, he's saying there's one church. Now, is that what people believe? I don't think so. But yet that's clearly what the Bible is saying. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And the gates of hell, or the gates of Hades, the gates of the grave, will not prevail against it. In other words, he was going to die, and then he was going to establish his church, and the, it was uh, um, such that, that he was not going to stay in the grave. He was going to come up out of the grave and establish his church, and so, but it was going to be his. That's the point. Up on this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So whose was it? It was Christ's, and how many were there? There's only one. A singular church is what Christ built. Now again, if you're, you know, if you're looking at your, at your community, you go through the yellow pages or go through the uh, listings in the newspaper, or whatever, you're going to find there's a whole lot of churches, and they're all different. They're all different. Not church is. Christ said, "Upon this rock I'll build my church," and it is the body of Christ. Now, friends, whenever someone says, tells you church of your choice, they're telling you something that's not in the Scriptures. And so there's no way we're going to have unity when everybody has their own church. I don't know how many times I've talked to people, knocked on their door, and, and uh, asked them, you know, where do you, where do you tend, where do you worship? And they go, well, I have my own church. Well, that right there tells you they don't understand what the Bible is teaching about the church. If you've got your own church, what about Christ's church? What about the church that Christ said he'll build? And, or he would build, and, and that is that uh, he did build. That's the that's the church I'm a member of. People, when people ask me, well, well, James, where's your church? I don't have a church. And see, they think I'm being smart or trying to be cute, but I'm not. I, I don't have a church. I'm a member of the Lord's church. See that? So when you're saying there's one body, we're talking about one church. Now, we're talking about one kind of church. Now, someone might say, well, and I've heard s several people say this, to try to explain away or try to get around this idea of one church and try to promote this idea of denominationalism. They'll say, well, what about, what about all those churches in Asia or the churches in Galatia? You know, the Bible says church is, church is, church is. Okay, what about the churches in Asia? Uh, in the book of Revelation, there's, a let there's letters written to the seven churches of Asia. Now, the seven churches... In Asia, I want you to notice this, are the same kind of churches. Now, here's what I'm going, to, I'm going to demonstrate this to you. I want you to notice how many times the Bible is its own best commentary. And friends, if we would just open the Bible up and let's just dig a little bit, let's search a little bit, you'll find how clearly it is to show that these are all the same kind of churches. I want you to notice, one of the churches that's mentioned in the book of Revelation, the, the seven churches of Asia, is the church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea. Now, the church of Laodicea was not uh, one of the uh, uh, great, uh, great churches that you would want to aspire to. Uh, it's, you know, certainly one that, uh, that when you look at it, you go, well, they're probably the worst ones. Jesus said to the church of the Laodiceans, these things set the amen, the faithful, the true witness, and the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, and thou art neither cold nor hot, and I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So the church of the Laodiceans, when John is writing this, they're, they're not in good shape at all. But friends, they're still the same kind of church that you read about in the Bible as all the other churches. Same kind, they're just located in, in the, the city of Laodicea. How do I know this? Well, turn to Colossians 4, Colossians 4, 
and verse 16. Now, if you're, if you're taking notes, and I really hope you are, I really hope you are, because uh, this is how you can go back and double check what I'm saying. I never ask you to take what I say at face value. I want you to write these scriptures down, and if I can give you a copy of this, these notes, whatever, I'd be glad to do that. But listen, when Paul is writing to the church at Colossae, all right, he writes to the church at Colossae, he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. Now, when he gets to chapter, when we get to chapter 4 and verse 16 of that letter, the, the Colossian letter, this is what he says. He says, when this epistle, or when this letter, is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. And that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So in the first century, they didn't have a New Testament. It was, it was in the process of being written, process of being preserved and written down and, and kept. So letters were being circulated. Paul says, now I'm writing this letter to you, to the church at, Col uh, at uh, Colossia. But when you get it, you see that it's read to the church of the Laodiceans and you read the epistle from Laodicea. So apparently Paul has, has written a letter to the church of Laodicea and they're supposed to swap letters, right? Instead of swapping preachers, they just, yeah, well, Paul got a, I got a letter from Paul. I'll let you read mine. You let me read yours. And so the church at Col Colossea and the church at Laodicea uh, are, are sharing the same information. Why? They're the same kind of church. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the Baptist church going now? Here's some here's some Baptist doctrine. Now we need to make sure that it's read over here in the United Pentecostal Church. And now and the information from the United Pentecostal Church. Let's make sure that it's read over here in the Presbyterian Church. And the the Presbyterian uh, Church, their material, their literature. Let's make sure that that it's being read. <clears throat> over here in the uh, Latter-day Saints Church. In the Latter-day Saints, let's make sure their information is being read in, in the uh, uh, Methodist Church. No, friends, that wouldn't happen in a million years. See, why? But different kind of churches. But these churches were swapping information, swapping letters, because they were both letters from the Apostle Paul, number one, and they were the same kind of church. Now, let's, let's continue looking a little more. See, when you start digging in the, in the Bible, you'll start finding all kinds of jewels that you missed. In Colossians 4 and verse 15, Colossians 4 verse 15, back up one verse before Paul says swap letters. Listen to what he says. He says, the brethren which are in Laodicea. Paul was in Laodicea. He knew brethren in Laodicea. Brethren. Now, did you get that? Now, friends, Listen, you cannot be brethren unless you believe the same thing. You cannot be brethren unless you're really in the same church. Now, when someone calls in, sometimes they, they, they say, well, Brother James, and they call me Brother James, and I don't know if they're a member of the Lord's Church or not. <clears throat> but if I know that they're not members of the Lord's Church, uh, you know, I, I'm telling you right now, I wish we were brethren, but we're not brethren. I don't mean that to be a slide. I'm just saying if you're not in the church of Christ, you're not a member of the Lord's church, we're not brethren. I'd love for us to be brethren, but we're not brethren. We're just friends. But I want us to be brethren. Because the only way you're going to be brethren is if we have unity that comes from, number one, being in the same church. Now, let me give you another example. In Galatians chapter 1, uh, Galatians uh, chapter 1 and verse 2, listen to what Paul says. All the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Now, there's another one of those phrases, churches of Galatia. Well, Galatia was a region, and there was a lot of congregations in that region, and thus Paul says, the churches of Galatia. But the churches of Galatia are all the same kind. How do I know? How do I know that? Well, <clears throat> notice, again, they're getting the same information that Paul gave to another church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1, Paul says now, and he's writing to the, to the church at Corinth, he says concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order, now that's a command, I've given an order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. 
Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. You know why the Lord's church, the church of Christ, you know why we lay by in store upon the first day of the week? It's because God, God gave the command, Paul gave the command, God gave the command through Paul to lay by in store upon the first day of the week. He gave that order to the churches of Galatia, and he gave that order to the churches to the church in Corinth, and thus he gave that same order to the church at Eden because we are the same kind of church. So when you're following the same pattern, you become the same kind of church, and that's one of the key elements of unity. You can't have unity if you're teaching a different doctrine. Now, I know that because I because when you start asking people <clears throat> who will say, well, we're all in the same church, we're all part of the body of Christ, and you start naming off them, the uh, uh, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that's the Mormons, or you start naming Jehovah's Witness, especially Jehovah's Witness Latter-day Saints, man, no one gives them any kind of, they don't give them any room in the body of Christ. No, they're cults. No, we're, we're putting them out. Well, why do you put them out, but you don't put everybody else out? They teach different things, just like everybody else teaches different things, but no one has a problem with it, except when it comes to the Latter-day Saints or the, or the Mormons, and or the, I'm assuming the Mormons are the uh, Jehovah's Witness, maybe the Catholics, but you see what I'm saying? But yet they're all teaching something different. Now, I submit to you that we don't have unity because they're not the same kind of church. And you can say, well, we all got together and have a big unity movement. No, you got together and we're in the same building. And you might have sang some songs together, but that's not what brought you unity. That didn't give you any kind of unity other than you had, uh, um, you know, you had, uh, you were doing something together. If you were really unified, you'd be teaching the same things in all churches. And that's why when Paul says there is one body, there's one body, that's a key element of, of, of fellowship, of unity. And friends, we're not together on that, that's for sure. Now, look at the next thing that Paul said. He said, one, one body, one church, one spirit. In Ephesians 4, he says, one body, one spirit. Now, I would say that probably one of the greatest dividers among denominations, what's keeping people apart, is not understanding, number one, not understanding the nature of the body or, or the church, and number two, is not understanding the spirit, how the Holy Spirit of God works. So when, when people say, well, there's one spirit, well, friends, think about this. How does a body live? What, what makes a body alive? James tells us in James uh, chapter 2 and verse 26, he says the body without the spirit is dead. So it's faith that works. But the body without the spirit is dead. So if the body of Christ is alive, it's got to have a spirit. It's got to have spirit. Now, Jesus is going to say that the, the words that he, he taught in John, John 6, 63, he said, The spirit that quickeneth and the flesh profiteth nothing, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But those words, the words that we have, the words that gives, gives life, are words that came from the Holy Spirit of God. John 16, 13, Jesus said, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever things he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So the, the, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, is what gives words that will produce unity. Now stay with me. If we've got all these different bodies or different churches out here, and yet they all claim to have the same spirit. Friends, I know that they don't have the same spirit because, number one, they're not unified in the same kind of body. But number two is because the spirits of those bodies are doing different things. They're causing those bodies to do different things. Now, watch this. Watch this illustration. In, uh, in the New Testament times, you had individuals that were possessed right, with unclean spirits, for example, in, in, in Mark 5. In Mark 5, the Bible says they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he, it's Christ, when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him one out of the tomb, met him out of the tombs, 
a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in, broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Now, this is the kind of behavior of someone who has two different spirits in, in their body, right? This man was alive because he had his own spirit, and then yet there was an unclean spirit that was causing him to do all these crazy things, cutting himself, crying, and, and, and so forth. And we could use another example of this in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, in verse 20, you have a man that brings his, uh, his son uh, to the disciples and then to Jesus to, to be healed. And the man said, uh, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, and, there, and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, he foameth, he gnasheth with his teeth, and, and pineth away. And I spake unto thy disciples, and they could not cast him out, and uh, they could not that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answered and said to him, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallow, wallowed foaming. Now, there was some spirit that was controlling this, this, uh, this, this boy, and it was causing him to act well, let's just say crazy, right? Foaming on the, uh, wallowing on the ground, foaming. Now, friends, let's think about this. If the church is a body, the church is the body, the body is a church, it's the body of Christ, and it has one spirit in it, it will be behaving in a certain way. And when I look at all these denominations or bodies, that's what they are, and you see how they're behaving, you know what that tells me? There's different spirits in all these different bodies. Because one body, one body of, of believers over here, one church, you, you walk in, you find them rolling on the ground, foaming and wallowing. Right? You, you can watch it on TV. You can see it. They're, you know, Pentecostal. They're up jumping around, hooping and hollering and rolling on the floor. What is that? What kind of spirit is that? And then you've got another spirit over here that's teaching something different. They may not be getting this body to, or this church to roll on the ground and, and hoop and holler, but yet they're speaking something different. Now remember, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, will not speak of himself, but he will guide you into all truth. So these different bodies, these different churches are teaching, speaking different things because the same spirit is not in control of all of them. Now, I know that because they teach different things, they act different ways, and so they can't be uh, being guided or, or governed by the same Spirit. Now, in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 and 2, Paul says that the Spirit, the Spirit of God, speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with hard iron. So there are some false spirits out here that are that will teach something differently, that will teach lies, doctrines of devils, seducing spirits, that is getting people to, to follow away or after or fall away from the truth. So when I when I see uh, people say, well we're all we all have unity. Well, there's no unity of the spirit. If there was unity of the spirit, you'd all be speaking the same things. You'd all, be, you'd all be going in the same direction. You see this? And how did all these different churches, all these different bodies, that's what the church, these churches are, they're their own different bodies, how, how, how did they come into existence? See? There had to be another spirit other than God's spirit that, that gave life to these different bodies. All right? Now, now what spirit gave life to the Jehovah's Witness body, the spirit of Charles Taz Russell. Now you can say, well, it was the Holy Spirit of God. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Because the Jehovah's Witness body is not even mentioned in the Spirit's words, which I know is the Bible. Now, what, 
what uh, what spirit gave life to the Latter Day Saints Church, Church of Jesus Christ Latter Day Saints, Joseph Smith. Now Joseph Smith said, "Well, he got his information from an angel." Well, what I hear from the Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter one and verse eight, I hear Paul say, "Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed." So if Joseph Smith got his doctrine, got his his message from the, the Spirit of God, it actually condemns. He's actually condemned already because he's given another another gospel. His gospel came from an angel, he says. Well, see, I know that's not the same Spirit that, that uh, gives words from the Bible. And so the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints comes from a different spirit. L.G. White, prophetess, Right? She has her own spirit. Gets her own information. All these denominations start from a different kind of spirit, friends. That's why I'm saying we're not having unity. People can say we have unity, but just the first two right out of the box. One body, one spirit. It's evident that there's not one body, one kind of church, one singular kind of church, unified kind of church, and there's not one spirit that's governing all these different bodies. Because if there were, they would they would be one body. Now you might have something to say about that. Maybe you won't take issue with that. That's fine. Let's let's um, you know have some dialogue. Um, the phone numbers again are three three six four two seven nine six nine six four two seven nine six nine six or six two seven nine five six three six two seven nine five six three. Now let's 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 move on to another one here. Uh, the next thing Paul says one. Right? One body, one spirit, one hope. One hope. Uh, friends, the hope that we have is a hope of eternal life. Now, stay with me on this one. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, Paul said, In hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Oftentimes I hear people say, Well, I have eternal life right now. No, friends. You may think you have eternal life right now, but really all that God promised is the hope of eternal life. All right, He promised the hope of eternal life, or he promised eternal life when this life is over. If you have eternal life now, then you'll never die. And I know that that's going to be the case. You're going to die or you're going to be alive when the Lord returns. But you don't have eternal life now. Listen, the hope that we have, the hope of eternal life, is in heaven. So if you have eternal life, which the Bible says is the hope of eternal life, I don't know how you got it because it's in heaven. Colossians 1 verse 5, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, wherefore ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel. The gospel tells you about the hope of life, right? The hope of eternal life which is laid up in heaven. And you say, well, James, how, then what, what, does, what does that mean when Jesus said you have eternal life? Well, how about this? How about God is saying you have the hope of eternal life in prospect? Listen, if God promised something, he says it as if it's true because he's going to keep his promise. Do you remember in um, Joshua, in Joshua chapter 6, uh, God has promised Joshua that he has, going to, he has given, he has given, uh, the city of Jericho to them. The land, the, the promised land, he's given it to them. And But yet when, when God spoke of it, he spoke of it as if it was already given, even though they weren't even crossed the river yet. In Joshua 1 verse 6, God says, Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide an inheritance of the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the uh, unto all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Uh, now, when we get to Joshua chapter six, the Bible says in verse two, the Lord said unto Joshua, "See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. They haven't marched around the city yet, but yet God said, I gave it to you." They haven't blown the horns yet, but yet God says, I gave it to you. But 
when they did what God said, when they compassed around the city, all the men of war, and they marched around it once for six days, and on the seventh day they marched around it seven times, and then they blew the horns, then that is when the walls fell down and the people took the city. But God is talking about it as if it's already been given. So he does the same thing with eternal life. I have given you eternal life in prospect, in, in promise, if you will do my will. Now, Paul says there's one hope. Now, the one hope that I have, friends, is of eternal life when this life is over. And you say, well, James, what does that really have to do with unity? Well, here's the thing. The hope that I have is connected with the Lord's return. Titus 2, verse 13, Paul says, Looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now, if we're hoping for the wrong thing, then we're going to be divided. And I can assure you that when it comes to the Lord's return, there's a lot of division about the Lord's return. And most people aren't talking about hope when the Lord returns. They're not talking about the hope of eternal life. Most people in the religious world today, in so-called Christianity, they are not unified on what's going to happen when the Lord returns. They're looking for a kingdom. Now, you just raise your hand. If, you're, if, if when the Lord returns, you're looking for him to establish a kingdom uh, on the earth and you reign for a thousand years, go ahead, raise your hand. You, you know that you know you do. You know you've heard your preacher talk about it. Either you're going, he's going to set up a kingdom, he's going to reign for a thousand years, something connected about that. There's going to be a thousand year reign, a millennial reign, either premillennial, uh, postmillennial, or tribulation, pre-tribulation, post-tribulation, whatever. You think, you believe all that. But friends, when the Lord returns, that's not my hope. My hope is not that he'll establish a kingdom. When the Lord returns, my hope is that I'll be found in him and that I'll be called up to join him, meet him in the air, and so shall I ever be with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Because when the Lord returns, he's not going to establish a kingdom. When the Lord returns, what he's going to do is he is going to uh, he is going to deliver up the kingdom. He's going to deliver up the kingdom to the Father. In uh, Luke 24, Luke 24, I want you to stay with me on this. Luke 24, see, people have been, mis have been uh, confused about the kingdom and what's going to happen when Christ returns <clears throat> for since, since, really since Christ died. I mean, before Christ, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, before Christ ascended back to heaven, his disciples asked him, Will thou restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? Acts chapter 1, verse 6. They didn't understand the nature of the kingdom. And in Luke 24, in Luke 24, uh, Jesus meets two people, two men, walking on the road to Emmaus. And they don't recognize him, uh, verse, uh, Luke 24, verse 15. And they talked together and all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass these, there in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him? But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Now that word, we trusted, when, when Cleopas said, we trusted that it had been he which had re redeemed Israel. That's the same word <clears throat> as hoped for in Hebrews 11.1. 1, where Paul says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is a substance of things trusted for. They trusted. They hoped for it. They're looking forward to it, and they're, they're waiting for it to be fulfilled. Now, friends, when Christ returns, are you hoping that he'll establish a kingdom somewhere? 
I mean, all the big, big hype is, well, <clears throat> you know, Trump said we're going to move the capital back to Jerusalem. You know, I, I'm for saying the capital of Israel is in Jerusalem. Well, okay, great, fine. That doesn't mean, as a Christian, that doesn't mean anything to me. That doesn't mean one hill of beans to me. You can put the capital in Jerusalem. You can put it in Tel Aviv. You can put it out there in the middle of the sea. I don't care. Because when Christ returns, the kingdom is not going to be established. The kingdom is going to be delivered back to the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. And he'll have put down all rule and all authority and all power. When Christ returns, he's going to give up the kingdom. He's going to give, give up all of his authority and rule that he's ruling. He's ruling right now. The kingdom has been established. Colossians 1 verse 13, Paul said, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now friends, I don't know how you think Christ is reigning, how he's sitting on his throne and doesn't have a kingdom. Is he sitting on a throne in exile somewhere? He's, well, I'm, I'm sitting on my throne. I don't have a kingdom yet, but I'm just sitting on my throne. No, he's ruling. Uh, Peter and the other 11 on the day of Pentecost, they said, This same Jesus whom you crucified, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that this same Jesus whom you crucified, the Lord hath made, or God hath made, <clears throat> God hath made both Lord and Christ. He's reigning. He's reigning and he has a kingdom. So the one hope that I have, friends, is not that Christ is going to establish a kingdom. But the hope that I have is that I'm going to be found in the kingdom, faithful in the kingdom, and that I'm going to be delivered back to the Father in heaven when this life is over. Now that's my hope. Now the reason I'm, showing, I'm saying that we don't have unity on that because most people aren't looking for uh, Christ to deliver up the kingdom. They're looking for him to establish it. And it's already been established. You know what the problem is? See, the problem comes from there's not unity on the church, the one body, and they're divided on the spirit because there's all these different spirits are telling people all these different things instead of going to the Bible, which we know came from the spirit. So there's no unity of body, there's no unity of the spirit, and there's certainly no unity of, of the one hope of our calling. Now here's another thing. One Lord. Friends, I know, I know that we are divided when it comes to the Lord. He said, well, James, everybody believes Christ. Okay. Well, if everybody believes that Jesus is their Lord, then why do they disobey him? You know, Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 46, He says, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? The problem is, the problem or the reason why we have so much disunity or division <clears throat> is because people do not want to follow God. They want to follow themselves. They're, they're their own king. They're their own master, one Lord. Now, if, if Christ is really Lord, then wouldn't, wouldn't you submit to him? Listen to what Paul said. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 13, the church at Corinth had problems. And someone says, well, James, you, you said the church of Corinth was one of these one kind of, the right kind of church. Well, they were. It doesn't mean that they don't have problems. It doesn't mean that they can't have problems. <clears throat> and, then, and they did have plenty of problems. As a matter of fact, they were so divided. One was saying, well, I am of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ. And then Paul says in verse 13, he said, this is 1 Corinthians 1, verse 13. He said, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were ye baptized in the name of, of Paul? Well, you're not divided. Christ wasn't divided, so why are you divided? Friends, when we're talking about one Lord, everybody in all the denominations claim that Jesus is their Lord. But if that's the case, then you have to have Christ divided up, chopped up in little bitty bits so that he can be in all these churches. And he's not divided. He's not divided. Just like people try to divide up the Spirit to say, well, the Spirit tells me to do this. Well, if the same Spirit is in all these different bodies, right, then why are they all doing something different? And if Christ is the head of all these different bodies, why are they all doing something different? You just can't say that there's one Lord 
and then be divided in all these different bodies. I mean, I mean, y'all, I mean, denominations have just basically uh, made a slaughter of the Lord. I mean, they chopped him up in little bits. They did committed more slaughter against the Lord's church than the, than uh, Saul of Tarsus did. Dividing them up in little bitty bits, saying, "Well, here he is. He's in all these different churches." Now. The reason why there's so much division is because man wants to be his own Lord, wants to be his own God, wants to be his own king. Matthew, Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And no one wants to deny themselves. They don't want to deny <clears throat> that, that uh, you know, they're giving up their free will or they're giving up their... Uh, Ability to choose. We're not saying give the ability to choose. But you have to choose to obey God. Submit to God. I mean, you still have freedoms to do do things, but not contrary to the will of God. But someone said, well, I, I want instrumental music. I want, uh, you know, I want a band. I want smoke machines. I want, uh, uh, you know, women pastors. I want to uh, have whatever. And so where does that come from? Well, they start doing their own thing. Start doing their own thing. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Well, when, with that attitude, when people say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what the scriptures say. I'm going to do my own thing. That's when you have division. And that's when, basically, you say, there, I'm not going to have one Lord. I'm going, to, I'm going to chop Jesus up, and he's going to be Lord to me, <clears throat> and I'm going to do what I'm going to say. I'm going to do what I want to. Uh, I say that's when people start say they say they say Jesus will follow you anywhere, but this is where we want to go, and they start taking off, and they think the Lord is going to follow them. And friends, it's not just the denominations. I mean, the Lord's Church does the same thing, just like the Church at Corinth. Yeah, we have people in our brotherhood do the same thing. They they don't want to hear. You know, this is not what what we should do. I talked to a. Um, young fella yesterday on the phone and uh, you know he's struggling with some things that, that a lot of people in the denomination struggle with authority and I told him I said that the problem that people have is they don't follow authority they don't want to say let's let the Bible tell us what to do and then let's do that and so this is what you have when members of the Lord's Church decide they're not going to do what the Bible says and they're going to do their own thing that they have division. They have trouble. But let me tell you something, friends. One day, somebody's going to tell you what to do. There, one person is going to tell you what to do, and that person is going to be Jesus. In Acts 17, Acts 17 and verse uh, 30 and 31, Paul said, The time of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. God chose the man that's going to judge the world, that's Christ. And he said, and there's a day. I've, appointed, I've ordained the man and I've appointed a day. And you can take it to the bank. Every knee's going to bow. Everybody's going to submit to him. And what they're going to hear is, they're going to hear either, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into thy rest, or you're going to hear, depart from me, I never knew you. Either work iniquity. I mean, you're going to hear one of those two things, and you're going to do it. If God says, come in, you're going to come in. If he says, go away, you're going to go away. And you're not going to say, well, I think I'll do it on my own time. No, you're going to go. Well, friends, if you really want to submit to the Lord, you really want to believe that there's, that there's one Lord, then... Why not just submit to him? Why not let it be known that, you know what, he's my Lord. I'm going to show you that I'm going to submit to him. Don't just give him lip service. Oh, Jesus my Lord. Why well, call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I ask? Now, how do I know that we don't have unity? Well, because I, I see that everybody's, everybody becomes their own Lord. All right? So, one body, one spirit, one faith, right? One hope of your calling. One Lord, uh, one faith is the next thing Paul says. One faith. Faith is a, is a body of belief. You know, it's a, it's a, set, of, it's a set of beliefs uh, that people follow. 
set of doctrines, you might say. Uh, in Acts 6 and verse 7, the Bible says that a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Now, friends, if we have unity, why are there so many different quote-unquote faiths out there? I mean, you ask somebody, well, what, 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 what faith are you? And they'll tell you, I'm Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, whatever. They understand that a different faith means we have a set of rules that we follow and that's, that's what makes us who we are. But friends, the Bible says, striving for unity, unity of the faith. Ephesians 4 and verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith. There, there is a, a singular set of rules that we all have to follow if we're going to be unified. It's the doctrine of Christ. It's the doctrine that Christ has set forth. Now, friends, when, if you say, well, you know, we follow the Baptist uh, manual or the, the, we got the Catholic catechism or you have the, the Methodist discipline or you have the, the Wesleyan discipline, you have the, the catechisms, the creed books and the whatever, that's what divides you. There's a... A fellow that comments on uh, on YouTube, he's a member of the Methodist Church, and he's he one of the comments. He said, "Well, you all just need to sit down and have, write write some creeds, some cre a creedal statement to solve all this all this uh, differences in the Church of Christ." No, the the creed has already been written. It's the Bible. The problem is not with the rules. The problem is with the people that follow the rules. Making more rules doesn't doesn't bring unity. Following the rules is what makes unity. And so when Paul says one faith, if we all follow the same set of rules, friends, then we'll have unity, but we're obviously not. And then he says, one, I'm, I'm coming out of time here. Let's see if we can get through this. One baptism. Friends, what, which baptism is it? What is the one baptism? Do you know there's, I think there's about seven baptisms in the New Testament. There's, a, there's the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus administers in John 1, verse 33. There's a baptism of fire, which I know some people in the religious world, they, they pray for the baptism of fire, but friends, if you really looked at the context and saw what that was, you would not want a baptism of fire. All right? There's, there's, a, there's John's baptism. In Mark 1, verse 4, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. Uh, there's a baptism of Moses in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 2, where Paul says they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Is that, is that the one baptism? When Paul said there's one baptism, is that it? There's a baptism of suffering in Matthew 20 and verse 22. There's a baptism of dishes in Mark 7 and verse 4. Yeah, Mark 7 and verse 4. Here, here's, here's the verse. He said, James, you're trying to be funny. I'm not, I'm not being funny. Mark 7 and verse 4, and when they come from the market, Jesus says, he's talking about the Pharisees. He said, when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be which they have received, which to hold as the washing of cups and pots and bra uh, brazen vessels and tables. And that word uh, washing, washing of cups, is baptismos. It's baptism. They, they baptized their dishes, baptized their cups. Now, I mean, as, as much as some people fight against baptism, I'd be afraid to eat at their house. They might not even want to wash their dishes. But is that the baptism that we're talking about? No. The baptism, the one baptism that is a foundation of unity is the baptism that forgives sins. A baptism that's connected with remission of sins. Acts 2 verse 38. Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. That's the one baptism that's commanded in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Friends, you you can't be baptized by the Holy Spirit. So you, Someone can't say, well, I command you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus is the one that does that. So if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's Jesus' fault. How can you obey that? But you know what you can do? You can obey, be baptized for the mystery of sins. That is, in the water of the river of baptism. You can do that. See? And so I know, I know that that is the baptism. That's the one baptism that we're talking about here. The, the uh, Baptist manual, Hiscox Baptist manual, has a statement on baptism which I find interesting, they spend all the time, they call themselves Baptists and they spend all the time fighting against baptism. But here's the statement. It says, baptism may not be essential to salvation, but it is essential to obedience. Now think about that statement, friends. 
it's not essential to salvation, but it is essential to obedience? Well, if obedience is essential to salvation, and baptism is essential to obedience, then baptism is essential to salvation. You just can't separate them. And that's why Paul was told, Why tarest thou arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord? Because that was the one baptism that is essential to put you into the body of Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. Uh, it's, the, it's the doorway into the body, the one body. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now friends, that's why that one body is so important. It's the church. And baptism is what puts you into the one, uh, to the one church. And then Paul says there's one God and one Father. The supreme giver of authority comes from God. Friends, if, if God is really going to be our God, if we're going to be unified on God being our God, then we have to ultimately submit to what he says. There, there's no other gods that can bring unity. No other gods that can bring peace. Jesus said, all uh, power is given unto me in heaven and earth. He got that from his Father. And God... And uh, the one God and one Father of us all is the only one that can bring peace and, and unity through his word. There, there are other gods out there that are so-called gods, they're not going to bring peace. Allah, the Muslim God, he's a moon god. He's not going to bring peace. Here's what his followers teach. His followers teach that peace and unity are going to come when you submit to Islam. Listen to what this statement, this is from uh, the statement of Hamas. A terrorist group, known terrorist group. It says, Islam is only hostile to those who are hostile towards it or stand in its way in order to disturb its moves or to frustrate its efforts. Under the shadow of Islam, is it possible for the members of the three religions, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, to coexist in safety and security? Safety and security can only prevail under the shadow of Islam the members of other religions must desist from struggling against Islam over sovereignty in this region. So here's how Allah says we're going to have unity. Just submit to me and we won't kill you. Boy, now that's, that's some coexistence right there, isn't it? You can exist as long as you don't fight against Islam. You know what, friends? That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says you can submit to God. You can choose to submit to God or you can not choose to submit to God. But if you want to have unity with all believers, it is a choosing to obey God from the heart, the doctrine that's, that's been revealed, Romans 6, 6 and verse 17. And that's the only way you can have peace that passes all understanding. And that's the only way we're going to have true unity. So, friends, I, I'm, I'm running out of time. Here's how you can become a member of the one body of Christ and have unity. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, Confess Christ before man and be baptized for the remission of sins. That puts you into the body of Christ, the one body that's guided by the one spirit that will give you the hope of one calling. And so this is how we're going to have unity. So friends, I'm going to give you our contact information. Again, if you would like to assemble with the Church of Christ, we meet at 250 the Boulevard, Eden, North Carolina. Sunday's at 9, 10, and uh, Thursday's at 7. And remember a word from the Lord right here on uh, on this program at 5 p.m. on Sundays um, Sunday afternoons. We hope that you will uh, tell your friends. You know, friends, give us a call. 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. 276-340-2653. A word from the Lord at gmail.com. Always make sure you're getting a word from the Lord. Until next week, God bless and have a good night.